This podcast details true crime cases. It contains adult themes and may contain descriptions of violence. It is not intended for children. Listener discretion is advised. Hey, this is Esther from Once Upon a Crime. I am thrilled to have been invited to participate in the Generation Y podcast 10-year podversary live show. Join me in helping Justin and Aaron celebrate their 10 years producing one of the best and longest-running true crime podcasts ever. The live show will take place on September 8th at the Screenland Theater in Kansas City, Missouri, or you can also participate by live stream. Tickets are available at genypod.com. There's a link in the show notes. Along with Justin and Aaron, special guests include Nick and the Captain from True Crime Garage, Charlie from Crime Lines, Bob Ruff from Truth and Justice, Josh from True Crime BS, and me. It's going to be epic, and you won't want to miss it if you're as big a fan of Gen Y as I am. They were actually my biggest inspiration for and for supporters of Once Upon a Crime. Once again, get your tickets for the live show or live stream at genypod.com, and I hope to see you there. I have a special treat for our new series. I've always been fascinated by crime, obviously, but I'm even more fascinated by female criminals. Statistically, women make up a much lower percentage of the population that engages in crime, so I'm always intrigued by these women. In this series, Wild Women, we are going to step back into history to learn about some of the earliest female criminals on record. Some of these wild women were the first settlers in the Old West. They made up a tiny but fascinating percentage of bandits, outlaws, gunslingers, and gamblers. I'm sure you'll find these ladies' stories pretty wild. First up, Sarah Jane Newman was just a girl when her family arrived in Texas Territory in 1820. She soon demonstrated that she was tough and resourceful enough to survive and even thrive in this harsh and sometimes violent environment. Later calling herself Sally Skull, her rumored violent temper resulted in frequent gunfights and multiple divorces. Was Sally Skull also a black widow who murdered at least two of her husbands? Let's take a trip back in time to find out. This is the story of Sally Six Shooter. Sally Newman did need a man and didn't seem to get along with them very well, but always seemed to have one around. She was married more times than most women in Texas Territory even imagined it was possible, five times in total. And what happened to a couple of these husbands after they fell out with Sally was a mystery that some didn't want to solve. Sally was, well, different to say the least. She roped and rode with the best of them. Sally was an expert horsewoman, and contrary to the conventions of the mid-1850s in which she lived, Sally didn't clothe herself in long skirts or ride side saddle. Instead, she adorned herself in pants and men's shirts, and rode tall and proud astride the best equines in her large herd of choice stallions. Her piercing blue eyes shone out from under the black bonnet she always wore, and seemed to look everywhere all at once, missing nothing. Her gaze swept over her environment in a way that suggested she was on the lookout for any challenge or other trouble that may dare arise. And if she sensed trouble, well, Sully dispatched with it quickly, drawing one or both of her pearl-handled six-shooters that were constantly strapped to her waist. Sally's temper was described as quick and terrible. She was said to be a champion cusser as well. One trail hand who rode with Sally said that his boss knew a variety of curse words that could, quote, scald the hide off a dog. Should Sally sense any disrespect aimed her way, or enter into a disagreement with some unfortunate soul, she would let out a barrage of expletives while simultaneously drawing both pistols in one smooth motion. 
it was best to clear the room as quickly as possible if Sally Sixshooter was displeased. Even with her stern countenance and rough clothing, Sally could still charm men. They may have liked her fiery energy, at least at first, or perhaps it was the way she moved. She was said to be a skilled fandango dancer. The fandango became a popular form of entertainment for early Western settlers. A style of music and dance that originated in Spain, fandango dancing made its way to saloons and dance halls throughout the Southwest and California. It was common for married women to admonish their husbands to stay away from old Sally Skull, afraid she'd plug them with one of her six shooters, while equally nervous, she'd steal their hearts. Sally had many suitors and married five times in total. Some of her husbands, it was rumored, ended up on her bad side and were never seen or heard from again. Accounts of her life seem to suggest that they were murdered by the hot-tempered Sally, and this is not out of the realm of possibility. Sally Skull learned early to handle her problems by violent means as a way of survival for the time and place in which she was born. Sarah Jane Newman was born in 1817 in Pennsylvania to Joseph Newman and Rachel Rab Newman. She was the fifth of ten children. Her maternal grandfather, William Rabb, was an impressive figure who passed on his assertive personality and adventurous nature to his daughter. In turn, Rachel Rabb passed these traits down to her children, especially young Sarah, who was called Sally. William Rabb was one of the first white men to settle in the area of Texas Territory near the Colorado and Brazos Rivers that would be called Austin. He was one of Stephen Fuller Austin's Old 300 or the settlers who purchased 307 parcels of land from Austin in Mexican, Texas. Rab was given the land in exchange for building a sawmill in what is now Fayette County. Sally's family arrived in Texas in 1823. They settled in a remote area in the middle of Comanche territory. Angry that treaties had been ignored and white settlers were occupying their traditional hunting grounds, bands of Comanches began raiding these settlements. Rachel Newman, Sally's mother, was often at home with her young ones when these raids occurred and was the only one on hand to protect the homestead. She was tough and didn't back down from a challenge, another trait Sally would share. Once when a young Comanche tried to enter the cabin by wedging a foot between the bottom of the cabin door and the dirt floor in an attempt to raise it off his hinges, Rachel swung an axe over her head and swung it down hard, chopping off the intruder's toes. Around this time, men were being enlisted to protect the settlers from raiders. These first Texas Rangers were enlisted and trained by Stephen Austin, and made of mostly volunteers. The Rangers were not officially sanctioned by the Texas government until 1836. One of these young volunteers was 24-year-old Jesse Robinson. Robinson, originally from Kentucky, was a military man like his father before him. Charles Michael Robinson had fought in the Revolutionary War. When Jesse Robinson was sent to protect Austin's colonists, Sally was only around seven years old. I like to think that she saw the dashing military man and instantly developed a schoolgirl crush on the soldier, vowing to seek him out someday and marry him. But this is just a guess. Perhaps their later meeting and subsequent marriage were simply coincidental. As Sally grew up, she exhibited bravery when faced with opposition. Once when her home was under the threat of another raid, she and her siblings barricaded themselves inside. Their only protection at that time was in the form of a male visitor, who became just as frightened as the youngsters when Comanches made their approach. In an attempt not to come across as a coward, the man pretended that his gun was broken to avoid having to confront the Comanches. He stated out loud, I wish I was two men, then I would fight those Indians. Sally, disgusted by his lack of stones, snapped, If you were one man, you'd fight them. Give me that gun and yanked it out of his hands. In 1830s, Sally's family moved to a more settled area known as Egypt, located about 40 miles due north of Houston. A year later, her father, Joseph Newman, died. Sally, along with her siblings, inherited her father's land and cattle. When her brother, William, who was acting as the executor, delayed in giving Sally her portion, she took it upon herself to cut out her part of the herd. Although Sally had received no formal education, she was smart and resourceful, and deemed herself ready to strike out on her own at the age of 15. She'd grown up herding cattle, driving them to market on horseback, and many other tasks typically only performed by men at that time. She also learned to play poker and was quite proficient at the game. At the age of 16, 
Sally married the dashing soldier she'd first encountered when she was just a girl. She and Jesse Robinson married on October 13, 1833, and began life as husband and wife on Jesse's Grant near present-day Gonzales, Texas. Jesse had fought in the Battle of San Jacinto and was granted title to this land in exchange for his service. They had two children together, a daughter named Nancy and later a son named Alfred. Sally, as all her husbands would eventually discover, was not one to back down from a fight. Contrary to what was expected of women at that time, Sally voiced strong opinions of her own, openly disagreed with men, and was not afraid to show her temper if provoked. Jesse Robinson likely believed his much younger wife, who would come into the marriage with land and cattle, would defer to his authority as the more experienced war hero husband. If this is what he believed, he was sorely mistaken. Sally's marriage to Robinson was contentious from the start. They argued frequently, and the fights often devolved into physical altercations. After the 10-year rocky marriage ended, Jesse filed for divorce, alleging adultery against his wife. Jesse reported that Sally was, quote, harboring and feeding a man whom she'd hidden away in an old wash house on their property. The man's name was only recorded as Brown, but later it was speculated he was actually her soon-to-be second husband, George Skull. First, however, the Robinsons needed to formally agree to the terms of their divorce. This did not come easily. There were allegations, suits, and countersuits from both parties. Jesse claimed that Sally had abandoned him in December of 1841, taking their young daughter with her. Sally, however, countersued, saying she'd separated from her husband due to, quote, excessively cruel treatment. She further charged him with wasting assets, specifically her inheritance, which she'd brought into the marriage. She petitioned the court for the 20 herd of cattle and other property which she insisted be returned to her. The divorce was officially granted on March 6, 1843. Eleven days later, Sally would marry for the second time. Hey there! This is Esther from Once Upon a Crime. A big thank you to all our new YouTube subscribers. If you like what you're seeing, make sure to tell a friend and share the true crime stories. Another way to support our show and keep getting Once Upon a Crime on YouTube is to buy me a coffee. Click on the link in the description box below to donate a couple of bucks to the show. Any amount is appreciated. You will have my undying gratitude. Thanks. Sally was divorced from her first husband on March 6, 1843 and married a second time to George Skull on March 17th. Skull, whose last name was spelled S-C-U-L-L, was a gunsmith. The newlyweds moved onto property owned by Sally on a parcel of land near Egypt in Wharton County. Sally and her ex-husband had been in an ongoing custody battle after their split. By all accounts, Sally was a devoted mother and fiercely protective of her children. The judge that granted her divorce from Jesse Robinson simply split all their assets in half, and didn't rule on who should retain custody of the children. As a result, they were placed in the middle of a never-ending battle between their parents. After a little over a year and a half of marriage to George Skull, they sold the last 400 acres of Sally's land and livestock. By now, she owned several head of steer, cows, and hogs. They also sold Skull's gun-making tools and other farm equipment. It appears that Sally and George took the proceeds and headed out of town. But before doing so, Sally abducted her daughter Nancy. On that same day in December 1844, her ex-husband filed a petition in Colorado County District Court, accusing Sally of kidnapping their daughter. Reports would later state that Sally took Nancy to a convent school in New Orleans, where she left her. Sally wanted her daughter to be educated and believed the only way to ensure this was to keep her away from her father. It's also most likely true that because she and Robinson had never been able to see eye to eye, this was simply another battle of wills for control. Later, Nancy was able to retrieve her son Alfred as well, and also placed him in a New Orleans school. Robinson eventually succeeded in locating them and moved them to another school. A pattern emerged in which Sally would discover where they'd been taken, arrive to claim them, and once again, enroll them in another convent school to hide them from her ex-husband. This went on repeatedly, with the children being moved between different towns and schools frequently. Her husband, George Skull, had been by Sally's side during these travels, but simply dropped out of sight in 1849. 
At around that time, a record exists listing Sally as single. Rumors began to circulate that George Skull had been a victim of Sally's infamous temper. Had he crossed her along a lonely desert road and paid the ultimate price? Was he buried somewhere out in the desert where his body would never be found? It may seem far-fetched to think that Sally murdered husband number two with what appears to be little provocation. But the rumors resurfaced and gained steam after another man, a mere acquaintance, found himself at the losing end of Sally's six-shooter. Sally was only married to George Skull for approximately four years, but she would keep the name of her second husband for the rest of her life. She made one slight change, spelling it now S-K-U-L-L, because she thought it sounded cooler. She wasn't wrong. Okay, that may be an embellished detail, that she spelled it differently for the cool factor. I like to think so, but I also think there may be a simpler explanation. We know that Sally had no formal education and that she merely placed her mark on formal documents, suggesting she couldn't write her own name. What most likely happened was that at some point, a clerk somewhere asked her name and spelled it the way most believe it would be spelled, with a K, and it just stuck from then on. Anywho, back to our story. George had disappeared, and by the fall of 1850, Sally was living as a single woman with her sister and brother-in-law in DeWitt County. By this time, she was 33 years old. Two years later, Sally moved to Nueces County and settled in the town of Banquete. It's here where Sally finally made her permanent home. She purchased and ran a horse and cattle ranch in Banquete. Sally had a keen eye for horses, having grown up riding and caring for them. She knew how to pick out the best horses from each herd to buy, sell, and trade. Sally was known as a tough negotiator, and she employed the most skilled Mexican vaqueros and ranch hands to help her run her operation. She was a fluent Spanish speaker and cut a strange figure as she rode alongside the men. They transported horses for sale and trade, sometimes over great distances along the Texas-Mexico border and the Gulf, as far as New Orleans. Sally's operation grew quickly, and with it so did her fortune and her reputation as an expert trader. In 1852, tax rolls recorded her holdings as a mere four horses and four head of cattle. But just two years later, those holdings grew to a total of 33 horses, 14 cattle, four yokes of oxen, and a wagon. In May of 1852, Sally was traveling outside of Corpus Christi, Texas, where the Lone Star Fair was in full swing. One man, named Colonel John S. Ford, who traveled to Corpus Christi to take in the fair's entertainment, later wrote out an account of an incident he'd witnessed. Along with several others, Colonel Ford claimed to see a woman shoot and kill a man. As he was leaving the fair to ride home, suddenly, quote, he heard the report of a pistol, raised his eyes, and saw a man falling to the ground, and a woman not far from him in the act of lowering a six-shooter. She was a noted character named Sally Skull. She was famed as a rough fighter, and prudent men did not willingly provoke her in a row, end quote. The gunfight, if that's what you could call it, took place in front of several witnesses and appears to be a credible fact. Some reports say that Sally was justifiably acting in self-defense. Whether or not this is true, the story resulted in Sally earning a reputation for having a quick and violent temper. Another interesting account of Sally's character was written by Julius Froebel. He described Sally as a perfect female desperado, who was known to reside, quote, on the wild border country of the Rio Grande. She can handle a revolver and a bowie knife like the most reckless and skillful man. She appears at dances, fandangos, thus armed, and has even shot several men at merrymakings. She carries on the trade of a cattle dealer and common carrier. She drives wild horses from the prairie to market and takes her oxen wagon alone through the ill-reputed country between Corpus Christi and the Rio Grande, end quote. By 1850, what most knew about this perfect female desperado was you don't mess with Sally's six-shooter. I guess what I can confidently state about John Doyle is that he was not easily scared away. Just a few months after Sally shot and killed a man after an altercation, Doyle walked up the aisle with the female gunslinger. He married Sally in October 1852 and joined her on her ranch in Banquete. In 1855, she and her cousin John Rabb, along with friend W.W. W. Wright, 
purchased 150 acres of land situated along Banquete Creek. The three worked the ranch together, building it into an important horse trading and ranching operation that in some form still survives to this day. John Rabb continued to expand the ranch holdings over the years, so much so that upon his death in 1872, his widow Martha came to be known as the Cattle Queen of Texas. Partner W.W. W. Wright's descendants still run the cattle ranch on a portion of the original property in North Banquete. His great-great-grandchildren now own what may be the world's largest longhorn herd with the brand Bow and Arrow. Sally was an easily recognized figure at that time, riding alongside Mexican vaqueros on the trade route from the Mexican border to the Gulf Coast. However, she often traveled this rough and dangerous route alone. She paid for her purchases in gold, which she kept in saddlebags at her side. She wasn't too worried about the danger. Her familiarity with the route, her many contacts along the way, and of course her confidence as a quick draw and expert sharpshooter all assured her of her safety. It's also probable that her reputation alone kept others from attempting to challenge her. Not much is known about Sally's third husband, John Doyle. This is most likely because only two years after they wed, Doyle disappeared. Stories about the fate of Doyle, as well as George Skull, have circulated over the years. The definitive answer about what happened to husband number two and husband number three may never be known. But the stories are thought-provoking. One version often told is that one of her husbands, tired of her temper, abuse, and contentious nature, decided to waylay her along the trade route. His plan was to stake out a remote location, shoot Sally dead, and steal her saddlebags so that her death would be attributed to an unknown bandit. His plan failed when his first shot missed. Sally drew her weapon and a gun battle ensued in which Sally emerged victorious. She then buried his body in the desert, where it would never be found, in retaliation for his betrayal. In another account, her husband died as a result of an accidental shooting after a night of drinking and dancing at a Fandango Hall in Corpus Christi. Sally, who'd spent the night downing whiskey shots and dancing until dawn, could not be woken in the morning. Her husband decided to revive her by pouring a bucket of cold water over her head. Waking startled, Sally, on instinct, drew her six-shooter and shot her husband dead before she knew what had happened. In another report, Sally was in a heated argument with her third husband, John Doyle, when in a fit of anger, she shoved his head into a whiskey barrel, saying, There, drink your fill! Only, she held his head under a little too long, and the poor man drowned. If this actually happened... Perhaps it made her think twice before raising her hand in anger afterward. However, if Sally attempted to adopt a more docile nature, she picked the wrong man to start with. Her fourth husband, Isaiah Watkins, himself prone to anger, may have taken advantage of Sally's newly acquired temperate nature and allowed his own violent nature to run rampant. By 1855, Sally Skull had three failed marriages and one successful horse trading and ranching business. You'd think it would be obvious where she should focus her time and attention. But maybe Sally, deep down inside, was a die-hard romantic who believed that her perfect love was just one more I do away. In the very last days of 1855, Sally married for the fourth time. On December 20th, she stood at the altar to take vows with Isaiah Watkins. But this short-lived union would last only three years, resulting in divorce in 1858. Her marriage to Watkins was filled with abuse almost from the start. Five months in, after an argument, Watkins beat Sally and then dragged her bruised and battered body almost 200 yards. Sally left that day and remained apart from her husband for a time before they ultimately reconciled. But things were no better, and Sally finally petitioned for a divorce. She accused Watkins of carrying on adulterous affairs openly. The court itself named one of the women. Only her first name, Juanita, is stated in the surviving record. After the divorce was granted, the Nueces County Grand Jury indicted Isaiah Watkins for adultery. Sally's fifth and final husband was 18 years her junior. In 1860, 43-year-old Sally wed 25-year-old Christoph Horsdorf, and good for her. Horsdorf had the unfortunate nickname of Horse Trough. Old-timers who remembered him said he, quote, wasn't much good, mostly just stood around, end quote. So I assume that he must have looked really good to old Sally Skull, which was the nickname most referred to her by this time. 
Civil war in the United States was declared in 1861, and Sally now retooled her business to meet the demands of wartime. Her ranch operation now included running wagon trains down the Cotton Road. The Union blockade of southern ports had halted all traffic of southern cotton to Europe. To get around this restriction, Texas cotton was moved during wartime over the Mexican side of the Rio Grande. Sally and her partners could see that transporting cotton to the border was a very lucrative opportunity. Once again, Sally's fluency in the Spanish language paid off, literally. Sally took the opportunity during these trips to visit her children. Her daughter Nancy was married and living in Bee County by this time, and her son Alfred also had a ranch located just north of San Patricio. Sally's life during this time appeared to be one in which she was happy, successful, and living peacefully with her young husband. He often accompanied her during these trips. But just after the Civil War ended, Sally and Horstorf rode off together, but he returned alone. At this point in our tale, Sally drops off the record books. What became of her remained a mystery. That is, until a lone account in a dusty forgotten file was discovered years later. In it, a man named McDowell reported a strange finding while riding between the Nueces River and the Rio Grande. In the middle of this desolate area, he came across a boot sticking up from the ground. Moving closer to inspect this odd sight, he discovered that the boot was attached to a body that had been buried in a shallow grave. For reasons that have been lost to history, it was believed to be the body of Sally Skull. Horse Trough moved north soon after he returned without Sally and then remarried. The last husband of Sally Skull, who mainly stood around looking good, was said to have made off with most of her assets. Since she was never positively identified or officially declared dead, the rest of her estate could not be claimed. But what we can claim about Sally Newman, a.k.a. Sally Skull, a.k.a. Sally Six Shooter, is that she was a rare and fascinating character, a female desperado, a self-made woman, and a boss bitch of the Old West. That will do it for this episode of Once Upon a Crime. If you'd prefer to listen to episodes of Once Upon a Crime ad-free, you have several options. You can become a Patreon member and get ad-free episodes, as well as hear them before everyone else, for just $2 per month. As an added bonus, you'll also receive OUAC merchandise sent to you for being a supporter when you become a patron. Go to patreon.com slash onceuponacrime to find out more and join. You can also listen to ad-free episodes in the Stitcher app if you're a Stitcher Premium member. For just $4.99 a month, you can listen to ad-free versions of all your favorite podcasts. Go to stitcher.com slash premium for more information. Once Upon a Crime is written and produced by me, Esther Ludlow. My research and production assistant is Lorena Garcia. Additional support for this episode was provided by Studio 71. Until next time, be good to one another. <laughs>